Loving God, loving our neighbour, is what the new life into which we brought by faith in Christ is all about. Let's pray. Father God, we do long for you to speak to us, and we thank you that you do through your word. We need your help now, I need your help as I speak, we all need your help as we listen. Speak to us by your word, achieve your purposes amongst us, change us and transform us, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please do take a seat. We continue our evening series in the book of Exodus, and we come this evening to the second half of what are called the Ten Commandments, picking up where we left off last week. We're in Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 to 21, so please uh, turn back in the Bibles uh, to uh, the relevant page, which I've forgotten to look up, so that we can look at that more closely together. 61, thank you, Ian. This is why it's great news that Gordon is speaking at uh, the Christian Life and Witness courses and not me. Now, the first four commands, as we saw last week, were all about loving God. That was verses 3 to 11. We looked at those last week. And the remaining six, what we're looking at this evening, are all about loving one another. They begin at verse 12. And so you have in those Ten Commandments, love God and love one another. Listen to these words of Jesus. He said... You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. As we saw last week, the Ten Commandments weren't given as a way for God's people to enter into a relationship with God. They were given to help us to know how to live in response to God saving us and making us his people. If you look back up to the beginning of the chapter, Exodus 20 and verse 2, you see this. This is God's opening words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In the book of Exodus, we see how God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. You remember the, the plagues and the Passover sacrifice of a lamb, the crossing of the Red Sea and that journey through the desert till finally God brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And there he established his relationship with them. He gave them the law, showing them how to live life his way. Just as his words created the world in Genesis, so his words created his people at Mount Sinai. In grateful response to his grace, Israel were to worship and serve their God. They were to live as his people according to his law. As Jesus summed it up for us, to love God and to love your neighbour. This is how God wanted them to live. This is how they showed that they belonged to him. This is what life lived as freed slaves looks like. This is the life that they were created and rescued for, set free by a loving God, who showed them what was best for them. In giving them his law, God revealed and he explained to them his heart and his character. In time, Jesus would come to show us the Father and to reveal him most fully to us. And so it's no surprise that the life that Jesus lived and the words that he said tie in very closely to what God reveals about himself in these words. Jesus was to show us what it's like for the law to be kept perfectly. And we too, when we trust in Jesus, when we're rescued by his death for us on the cross, are freed from slavery to sin and death. We're adopted as God's children and we're called to a life of holiness. The Christian life of holiness, lived in obedience to Christ, flows from the relationship that we now have with the Son and the Father through the Holy Spirit. Loving God, loving our neighbour, is what the new life into which we brought by faith in Christ is all about. And so we're going to spend the bulk of our time this evening look at those, looking at those six commandments. We have to be brief. There's lots that could be said that I won't be able to say. But as we go through them, I hope that they will help us to, to appreciate them and see them again and to learn from them. So let's dive straight in. Uh, 
We begin with the fifth commandment. You'll find that in verse 12. It says this, Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. When we're children, honouring our father and mother means obeying them. And then as adults, we should continue to serve and to respect and to love and to care for them all of their lives. Now, all of us will need to work out what that looks like. And it's different whether we're single or married, whether they are Christians or not, whether they live near us or far away. As Jesus submitted himself to Mary and Joseph, Luke chapter 2 verse 51 tells us he was obedient to them. So we too are to obey our mother and father. As an adult, Jesus honoured his mother. You remember that moment when he planned for her as he looked after her, uh, when he cared for her, even as he suffered on the cross by asking his friend John to look after his mother. Obeying this command won't come naturally, of course. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. From our earliest days, led and driven by sin, we simply want to rule ourselves. We don't want anyone else telling us what to do. So it's not easy. And of course, even hearing this commandment for many of us uh, brings a whole mixture of feelings. Perhaps our parents are no longer alive. Perhaps... We have painful and difficult memories to deal with. But this is what the Lord calls us to do. We please and obey him when we honour our father and our mother. And notice it has a promise attached, that it, go me- that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land, as Paul puts that in Ephesians chapter, three, uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And that promise is a reminder that this commandment is the basis for order and for good for the whole of society. Obeying our parents is the beginning of respecting authority in general. If we don't learn to respect authority in the home, then our society, our culture will be chaotic. And in the same way, in the same vein as this commandment, we're also to show respect for others that God has appointed in authority. We're to honour teachers and pastors in the church. We're to honour the government in our state. We're to honour, above all of them, our Heavenly Father. Obedience and submission to other humans, of course, has limits. All authority comes from God. He alone is the King of kings, and we're to love, honour, and obey him rather than anyone else if they command us to sin. Just like those Israelite midwives did when the king of Egypt told them to kill the boys born to the Israelites, just as Peter and the other apostles said, we must obey God rather than you when ordered by the authorities not to speak the name of Jesus. And in the same way, Jesus teaches us that loyalty to him must come above loyalty to our parents. So that's the fifth commandment. What about the sixth? Look at verse 13. You shall not murder. I'm sure you know the answer to this, but what does it mean not to murder? I'm not to take the life of another. From the moment of conception to our final breath, life is God-given and therefore sacred. God alone gives life. God alone takes life. You shall not murder. And like with many of these commandments, Jesus showed us that this extends beyond the literal, strict sense of the the commandment. It's extended by Jesus to show us that we're not to harm others. We're not to kill others, as it were, in our hearts by hating them, by killing them and destroying them by our words and our deeds. Listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus said, You've heard it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I, Jesus, say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. We are to love God and our neighbour by not murdering, but also by holding back selfish anger and insults, by defending the helpless and the unborn, by rescuing those who damage themselves, and by helping others to do, and by by doing them good rather than harm. Seventh commandment, look at verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery. 
Marriage is a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman, and it is holy. Those who are married are to be faithful to their spouses as long as they both shall live. Marriage reflects the faithful love that unites Christ to his church. So we see here a command that we are not to engage in sexual activity with anyone other than our spouse. And I'm to be faithful in my marriage, exclusively devoted in heart, in mind, and in body. Now, of course, strictly speaking, adultery requires at least one of those involved to be married. But this shows us that in God's created order, sex is reserved only for marriage. And so as well as adultery in the stricter sense, sexual immorality also includes sexual intimacy, even if it's consensual between those who are not married. In fact, all sexual activity outside of marriage, as defined by God, violates his design for sexual intimacy. Listen to how Jesus expands on this command even further. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus shows us that this covers not only what I do sexually, but also what I think and how I treat others. I'm to view others as those made in the image of God, not as objects, objects to be used and abused for my own benefit. We're called to be sexually pure, to honor one another in body and in mind. And this is not designed to rule out fun. God created sex, he created it for our good. Living God's way brings freedom and is good for us. It protects us. It avoids difficulties in marriage, it protects us from harm in all sorts of ways, in this most precious and vulnerable aspect of who we are as human beings. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And then number eight, look at verse 15. You shall not steal. Again, simple to work out what that means. I must not take what does not belong to me. I guess most clearly in mind here is property, things that belong to others. But the Bible also talks, for example, of theft. In these terms, uh, for example, an employer stealing from a worker the wages that they are owed, or uh, the use of unjust weights and a lack of honesty in business dealings. Theft perhaps also includes not returning something that you've borrowed, or lying on your tax or benefits application form, breaking copyrights on books or films or computer software, helping ourselves to supplies from our workplace. You shall not steal. And if you have stolen, we should repay and do the best of our ability to restore what we have taken. Remember in the New Testament, the example of Zacchaeus, who stole. But then, when he became the child of God, he gave back what he had stolen. Instead of stealing from others, we are to give and not to take. And part of this is, Obeying this commandment means remembering that everything we have, everything we own, all of our gifts and abilities is given to us by God. I'm to use them for his glory and to respect what he has entrusted to others for their use. Instead of taking, I'm to give from what God has given me. I'm to care for those who depend on me. I'm to give to, good, to God's work and to the poor and not steal. Number nine, look at verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, the language that's used here refers to a situation in the court of law where you're involved as a witness. The command is clear. You should speak the truth. You shouldn't lie. It's very simple. It doesn't give any exceptions, any reasons why it would ever be right to to speak falsely in such a legal situation. And so it rules out falsely accusing others lying, withholding evidence, contributing to an unjust verdict. All of these things violate truth and justice. So for example of what this commandment looks like, uh, here's Exodus 23 verse 1, you don't need to turn to it. It says this, you shall not spread a false report and you should not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Jesus himself suffered from false testimony. The 
the Sanhedrin who wanted to execute Jesus did precisely what this commandment rules out. They hired witnesses to lie about him. Yet Jesus himself always spoke, spoke the truth. He spoke the truth about himself. He spoke the truth about us. And those who follow him are also to be those who speak truthfully and graciously at all times, not just in court. We're to keep our tongues from lying. We're to avoid slander, spreading lies about someone else. We would avoid gossip, spreading what might well be truth, but is spread with the aim of damaging others. We're to report crimes, we're to advocate for the helpless, we're to protect the community. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. And then number 10, look at verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not covet. I'm not to let envy make me want what others have, but in humility I should be content with what God has given me. And this is all about the dangers of what lies in the hidden recesses of our hearts. What begins with secret discontent in mind and heart, if left unchecked, leads to sins such as idolatry and, and adultery and theft. We are not to covet, rather we are to be content with what God has given us. Hebrews 13 verse 5, for example, says this, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Jesus shows us what this looks like. He took on the form of a servant. He gave up all of his rights without wealth or possessions. In his earthly life, he loved and he trusted his father in all things. He did not grasp. He gave up everything so that in him we would have every blessing and an inheritance as his adopted children. And that is precisely the truth we need to reflect on that will keep our hearts content in him and free from coveting what others have. You shall not covet. These are challenging words. Have you ever wished your life was different? Have you ever wished that someone else didn't have something because you don't have it? Have you disliked them because they do? Have you grown bitter with God because he chooses to give a blessing to someone else and not to you? That is the challenge of the 10th commandment. So there we have it. Our title this evening was How to Love One Another. I don't know what you expected perhaps not commandments, but this is what the Lord God says. This is how we are to love one another. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbour's. There you have it. That is how we are to live as God's people. We need to listen to these words from God so we know how to love him and how to love one another. These words come with God's authority. They are to be obeyed because he spoke them. They reflect the way he created the world. And our relationship with God stands behind every one of them, even the ones that seem to be, not about our relationship with God, but our relationship with one another. So, For example, fathers and mothers are to be honoured because God is a father to his people and God is to be honoured. We're not to murder because God alone gives life and people are made in his image. No adultery because God made us, male and female, that we may be one flesh. No theft because God makes poor and he makes rich. No false witness because God does not lie. No coveting because God alone is to satisfy and in him alone are our desires met. And as we're reminded of these commandments, we need to remember that Jesus encouraged us to apply them to the maximum, not to look for the legal minimum. Let me tell you a story to illustrate that. When I was a student, I lived in a house with five other people, and this was way back in the day. There were no mobile phones. We had one phone for the house, and the worst thing was answering the phone when you knew it would be for someone else. And one of my housemates was a lawyer, and uh, one day her mum phoned, and she did not want to speak to her mum. So she said, tell my mum I'm in the bath. And she ran to the bathroom and stood into the empty bath. And 
Of course, technically, if we'd have said, yes, she's in the bath, that would not have been a lie. But as God's people, we're not to look for the minimum application of these commandments, but the maximum. We are to be people characterized by these things, characterized by truth, not just those people who are not technically liars. And while sin causes us to resist and ignore God's will, to care more for ourselves than our neighbors, while that dynamic is true in our lives, then we will not live as these commandments outline perfectly. We know that. But as God's people, God is at work in us, and one day we will live like this, when he completes his work of grace in us at the end of the age. One of my favorite verses is, is 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. They say this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So that day is coming when we will live like that. But until then, we'll fail to keep every one of these commands. Of course, one purpose of the law was to show us our inability to obey God, to show us who we are and all the ugliness of sin, and to push us to see our need for a rescuer. And that rescuer was Jesus. As a human, he lived the perfect life. As an unblemished lamb, he was able to offer himself to God, suffering death in our place on the cross. So our sins are forgiven when we confess them because he took them on himself and he paid the penalty for our failure to keep these commandments and many others. And instead, now, as his people, the perfect obedience of Jesus is now counted as mine. That is great news. And as we read these commandments, that's what we need to celebrate. And remember, we're not just forgiven. We're given the gift of the Holy Spirit who changes our mind and our will and our desires so that we want to obey him. And by the Holy Spirit's help, we are progressively, step by step, transformed and conformed to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ a work that he has begun, and a work that will continue on that day when he welcomes us into our heavenly home. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for that truth that you have called us to be your people, not through anything that we have done, but by your wonderful act of mercy and of rescue. Thank you that you don't just rescue us, but you show us what it is like to live as your people, a life of freedom, a life that honors you, a life that is good. Father, help us to love you and to love your ways. Help us to depend on the power of your Holy Spirit day by day to live these things out in our church, in our families, in our nation, in our workplaces, wherever you put us. But Father, we know that we will fail and when we do, we thank you for Jesus and his work of rescue on the cross. Cause us to run back to you. Cause us to depend on you. Change us by your spirit and keep our eyes fixed firmly on that day when we too will be made perfect. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.